welcome to Reflecting on His Word, a Bible study intended to help Christians deepen their walk with the Lord by deepening their understanding of Scripture. Well, hello there. Welcome to our Bible study. This is Reflecting on His Word, and we like to not got this recorded. Uh, we had a major storm roll through a few days ago, uh, well, about a week ago now, and for some reason, my computer no longer recognized my microphone, and I was trying to record on these condenser mics on the camera or the laptop, and it was sounding just awful. Um, I don't necessarily have a pretty voice, but my goodness, that was sounding terrible, room noise and all of that. So you didn't want to hear all that. What you want to hear is God's Word. So let's do that. We're Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 29. Exodus chapter 29, we're reflecting in the book of Exodus and I'm titling this lesson, Concentration on Consecration. We'll read the entire chapter. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. Take one young bullock and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread and cakes unleavened tempered with oil, and wafers unleavened anointed with oil. Of wheaten flour shalt thou make them. And thou shalt put them into one basket, and bring them in the basket, with the bullock and the two rams. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shalt wash them with water. And thou shalt take the garments, and put upon Aaron the coat, and the robe of the ephod, and the ephod, and the breastplate, and gird him with the curious girdle of the ephod, and thou shalt put the mitre upon his head, and put the holy crown upon the mitre. Then shalt thou take the anointing oil, and pour it upon his head, and anoint him. And thou shalt bring his sons, and put coats upon them, and thou shalt gird them with girdles, Aaron and his sons, and put the bonnets on them, and the priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. And thou shalt consecrate Aaron and his sons. And thou shalt cause a bullock to be brought before the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the bullock. And thou shalt kill the bullock before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And thou shalt take of the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with thy finger and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. And thou shalt take all the fat that covereth the inwards, and the caul that is above the liver, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them, and burn them upon the altar. But the flesh of the bullock, and his skin, and his dung, thou shalt burn with fire without the camp. It is a sin offering. Thou shalt also take one ram, and Aaron his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the ram, and thou shalt slay the ram. And thou shalt take his blood, and sprinkle it round about upon the altar. And thou shalt cut the ram in pieces, and wash the inwards of him and his legs, and put them unto his pieces and unto his head. And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And thou shalt take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. Then shalt thou kill the ram, and take of his blood, and put it upon the tip of the right ear of Aaron, and upon the tip of the right ear of his sons, and upon the thumb of their right hand, and upon the great toe of their right foot. And sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And thou shalt take of the blood that is upon the altar, and of the anointing oil, and sprinkle it upon Aaron, and upon his garments, and upon his sons, and upon the garments of his sons with him. And he shall be hallowed, and his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. And thou shalt take of the ram the fat, and the rump, and the fat that covereth the inwards, and the caul above the liver, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them, and the right shoulder, for it is a ram of consecration." and one loaf of bread, and one cake of oiled bread, and one wafer out of the basket of the unleavened bread that is before the Lord. And thou shalt put all in the hands of Aaron, in the hands of his sons, and shalt wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And thou shalt receive them of their hands, and burn them upon the altar for a burnt offering, for a sweet savor before the Lord 
it is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And thou shalt take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration, and wave it for a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be thy part. And thou shalt sanctify the breast of the wave offering, and the shoulder of the heave offering, which is waved and which is heaved up, of the ram of the consecration, even of that which is for Aaron, and of that which is for his sons. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons by a statute forever from the children of Israel. For it is an heave offering, and it shall be an heave offering from the children of Israel of the sacrifice of their peace offerings, even their heave offering unto the Lord. And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him to be anointed therein and to be consecrated in them. And that son that is priest in his stead shall put them on seven days when he cometh into the tabernacle of the congregation to minister in the holy place. And thou shalt take the ram of consecration and seethe his flesh in the holy place. And Aaron and his son shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And they shall eat those things wherewith the atonement was made to consecrate, to sanctify them. But a stranger shall not eat thereof, because they are holy. And if aught of the flesh of the consecrations or of the bread remaineth unto morning, then thou shalt burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten, because it is holy." And thus shalt thou do unto Aaron and to his sons, according to all things which I have commanded thee, seven days shalt thou consecrate them. And thou shalt offer every day a bullock for a sin offering for atonement, and thou shalt cleanse the altar, when thou hast made an atonement for it, and thou shalt anoint it to sanctify it. Seven days shalt thou make an atonement for the altar, and sanctify it, and it shall be an altar most holy." Whatsoever toucheth the altar shall be holy. Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar, two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. The one lamb shall be an offering in the morning, and the other lamb shalt thou offer at even. And with the one lamb a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of an hen of beaten oil, and the fourth part of a hen of wine for a drink offering. And the other lamb shalt thou offer at even, and shalt do thereto according to the meat offering of the morning, and according to the drink offering thereof, for a sweet savor, and an offering made by fire unto the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you and speak there unto thee. And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. And I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Let's pray together. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for that wonderful sacrifice of your Son. And we thank you for these beautiful pictures of all of that, all these proceedings in the tabernacle. We thank you for the beautiful picture of the Christ that you give us here. Now, Lord, help us to fully appreciate all this means to us, to take in your holiness, to take into account all that you've done for us, and that this would change us. We would be convinced all the more and motivated to serve you as we ought, to spend time in prayer and in your word, to draw close to you and become more and more like you every day. And Lord, as we do these things, we pray that the fruit of that will be the joy of serving you and exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit, that you will be glorified, your kingdom will be magnified, and Jesus be lifted up, that all men be drawn to him. We ask these things in the precious name of the Christ, the Lamb that was slain, the Lamb without spot or blemish. Amen and amen. So we're finishing up this wonderful picture. We've seen the furnishings of the tabernacle 
and the construction of the tabernacle, and we talked about the makings of the ephod and the robe and the girdle and all the garments that Aaron and his sons would wear in the service of the Lord. And we've seen here all the accoutrements of the tabernacle, the furnishings thereof, and the garments that Aaron and his sons would wear and how they were made and then now how they were sanctified. And it's important we understand that the how of what we're doing matters. The how matters. And of course, we titled this Concentration on Consecration. And we talk about the consecration of the priests, verses 1 through 9, and then the sacrifices for that consecration, the, the bullock and the rams, and, through, and verses 10 through 25, and then the food for the priests. Some of the sacrifices were food for them. That's 26 through 37. And the continual burnt offering that would be offered by Aaron and his sons and the, the Levites to follow, that they would be offering these things day and night for the children of Israel. We are concentrating on this consecration. I was fixing to get in and start talking about it, but let's go ahead and start at the top, shall we? Um, there's so much to cover here. Um, I hope to do it justice. Uh, in verse 1, we're talking about, Thou shalt do this to hallow them to minister unto me. There's an important preparation of the priests for the priesthood, for the priests, for the function of what they do. Now, Jesus is our high priest, and we, we need not to mistake a, a pastor as a priest. He's not functioning as a priest at all. But I think it's very clear that when we see what Aaron and his sons, when we see what the uh, Levitic practices are, that the worship of the Lord is to be taken very seriously. Remember, their garments were made for consecration and holiness and beauty. And I think that matters. And though a priest is different than a pastor, when we stand before God's people, stand before a congregation, sharing God's word with them, it is every bit as important as this. Now, things have changed since the Christ has come. We do things differently. We no longer have to do the sacrifices. He was the once and for all sacrifice, the superior sacrifice, and that superior high priest. But as we teach about these things... It is my considered opinion that we need to be as, we don't have to be formal necessarily, but we need to give it the dignity. Our worship needs to have the same dignity that the children of Israel were instructed to give as they did the workings of the tabernacle and the sacrifices there too. There needs to be an order. There needs to be orderliness. And I think it does a disservice to our Lord when a pastor mounts the platform, stands behind that sacred desk in blue jeans and a t-shirt. I, I don't even like the open collar thing with a suit coat and open collar. I don't even like that. I think, and, and, and there are people that say, well, that's just a cultural thing. And it is, but wait, hold on. Let's talk about that. Because what we need to do is reflect credit on the Lord. We need to show the dignity and the importance and the holiness of the Lord by how we conduct ourselves in worship. Now, yes, a business suit or a sport coat and tie is a Western thing, and it's how we dress up. And that's true. But we owe it to our culture to give them an unmixed message. You know, the whole business, you know, these kids nowadays, they wear tennis shoes with a suit and they think they're doing something new. We were doing that back in the seventies when we were rebellious, long haired hippie freaks. And I'm here to tell you that that does not do justice for the Lord that, you know, they, it's stylish. And many of these pastors are, oh, they wear their skinny jeans. They wear their golf shirt and they're, oh, they're in great shape. They're slender and all that. And that's, that's good. They need to not be fat. But the point being, that we owe our culture the proper cultural message that what we're doing is important. Yes, this is cultural, but we owe them cultural honesty. Now, if we were in another culture, we might dress another way. Every culture has had a dress up. Every culture has a dress up. 
whether they be painting their face and, and putting on a, a different loincloth or they'd be putting on furs or bright colors or white colors or whatever it is, they have a dress and they have a dress up. We owe the people and we owe our Lord a dress up. And if you don't buy that, I'm sorry. I think you're missing the point. This is important to us, and we need to show the same dignity toward the proceedings of the Lord as the children of Israel were instructed to do. These things are important. This is my opinion. If you don't like it, give me a message. Give me a call. Shout out to me. We'll talk about it. But this is important. Everything we do for the Lord is important. And that's why the priests are being consecrated here and why God gives these specific instructions. Now, Part of the reason for the very specific and very elaborate instructions for the building of the tabernacle, the furnishings of the tabernacle, the proceedings of the offerings, and all the things that took place in the Levitic practices is to show us how complicated and how tiring it is to do this every day. They were doing one uh, a sacrifice in the morning and sacrifice in the evening every single day from then all the way through. And, well, they stopped a couple times when they were off in uh, captivity and all. But the point being, they were doing this every day. And then on special days, they had certain special offerings. And they did those in addition to those. And there was a veritable river of blood coming down from the temple. And as a matter of fact, Jesus had to step across that little stream of blood to get to the olive grove, to get the garden of Gethsemane and pray, not my will, but thy will be done. I can only imagine Jesus looking at that blood and knowing that it's going to be his blood that pays the price. That blood that was coming from the temple, that blood that they're sacrificing here in the tabernacle, that is simply a symbol that points to the Christ that would come. And what a wonderful moment, him stepping over that little creek and replacing that creek with his own blood. Oh, he loved to do it. He was willing to do it. The Father gave him up willingly. He did this for us, the undeserving, sinful wretches that we are. And why he did it, I cannot begin to tell you. But he chose to love us, and he chose to do this for us. This is a beautiful picture, and it's a beautiful thing to understand him uh, coming, crossing paths with all of this. It's, It's exciting to me. So, but all of this is important. This is all so very important. And you may say, well, the, the, the symbolism and stuff, that's past. And, and it is, except that we talk about what the Christ did for us. We still talk about it. We don't do the symbols, but we still talk about those symbols. We still talk about the cross of Calvary. We talk about him shedding his blood. We talk about him being buried and raised again th- the third day. All these things according to the scriptures. We talk about these things because they are important. And you may say, well, nowhere in the Bible does it say dress up and make it formal. But I think it's pretty plain here. I think it's pretty clear. And I'm going to stand on this. And and I've talked to a lot of people about it. And nobody has a lucid argument against it. Some say, well, I'm just more comfortable. Oh, so worship's about your comfort. Eh, they, they come up with excuses. Well, it'll make people feel uncomfortable. And you know what? I don't believe it. I knew a deacon. Um, he wasn't perfect. But one thing he was, was greeter extraordinaire and friendly and loving. And he always wore, he had very nice suits, Um, not just off the rack stuff. These were very nice suits. And you know what? Nobody felt uncomfortable around him because he never met a stranger. He could work a room. And when a stranger walked in to that congregation, he put his arm around them and treat them like family. And they never it, it, they, you didn't see them squirming. They loved talking to him. They loved being around him. He didn't make them uncomfortable. He made them feel loved and comfortable. It's not the suit that makes people uncomfortable. It's your hoity-toity behavior. It's your, well, yeah, go, go in the back pew there because I don't know you. You're not my friend. That's what makes them feel uncomfortable. Us dressing appropriately for church makes them know that we're serious. We owe them the proper message. Because if, if we're not serious about church, why would they want anything to do with it? They're looking for an answer for their life. They're looking to be rescued from their sin. They want change. They want different. They don't want Walmart. They've got Walmart. They want the Lord. And so, uh, I'm sorry, I'm chasing rabbits on this, but it is so very important and we are so lacking in the church. 
today. So all of this is symbolic of what's going to take place. And of course, the washing of those uh, offerings symbolizes the resurrection. The washing um, of the lower um, equals that daily cleansing. And so all of that is taking place so we can consecrate the priest. And I won't go through all the details but know that this is a perpetual statute for them. This is how it must be done every single time because this is important. This is the premier picture of the Christ. So it was very important that they do it right and they do it well. So we're going to skip on down a little ways. We've, we've read it uh, in its entirety. Down at verse 12, thou shalt take the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar. Now, this is, uh, I use King James simply because that's what I started with. I'm not a King James only kind of guy, but that's what my memory work is in. That's what I, in my, the Bibles I use for study. I know that the verse I'm looking for is bottom right, you know, and so some of that is just, I'm accustomed to it. But with the King James, it's a little bit unfortunate that it just says altar here. Now, if you will go to Leviticus chapter 4, verse 7, it gives a little more detail. See, the in the Pentateuch, we get uh, a picture all the way along. That's why it's important to study all of Scripture and not just take one spot. Because you might say in this one spot, well, it doesn't specify which altar, so it doesn't matter which altar. Well, it does matter. And later on, it's specified in Leviticus. Um, and the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation. It's dead center down the middle. Remember, we have the the uh, the lamp on the one side, the table of showbread on the other side, and we have the in- altar of incense before the curtain to go into the Holy of Holies. And that was to be ministered on a regular basis. It had its utensils and all, of as you've known. But the drop of blood with the finger was done to that horn of that altar and then the burnings would take place at the brazen altar out front. And I wanted to do that jump back and forth so you'd understand that we don't, this is not the complete exhaustive account. You need to look through the entire Pentateuch and even much of the Old Testament to get little bits and pieces to put this whole puzzle together. You see, this was written for us, but it was not written for us to build all this stuff up. We don't need all the details. We just need to understand that there were many details and that they followed them to the letter. And so they did that upon the the altar, the, the blood on the altar of incense and the burning done at the brazen altar out front. And so on down in verse 16 is where we get the sprinkling the blood round about upon the altar. This is the brazen altar there. So it yeah it's very complicated. There's a it's a lot of back and forth, and there's not a lot of specificity in some of these things. But we don't need those things; otherwise, they'd be in there. But we do need to know that God did specify, and He wants it exactly as He said. And that was at least for now the aim of the children of Israel to do it exactly as He said. So we'll skip on down to verse 23. And one loaf of bread and one cake of old bread and one wafer of the basket, unleavened bread that is before the Lord. Um, And this is uh, a wave offering and a heave offering. They're doing these things before the Lord. Um, It's a way of offering things without them being consumed. The Levites, all Aaron and his sons, were to be provided for by the congregation and they would take a portion, certain portions of their offerings to feed them and their families And so some of the offerings were wave offerings and heave offerings. And there were different reasons for different things. Once again, the complexity to make sure they understand that this is a hard, long thing and that we have need of a, the ultimate sacrifice of our Lord. And so uh, we have the heave offerings and the burnt offerings and the wave offerings. And we'll skip on down to verse 33 and they shall eat these things. This is the offering that Aaron would eat a portion of it uh, from the people, the, the ram, the second ram. And they would eat the portion of it. And they shall eat those things wherewith the atonement was made to consecrate and to sanctify them. There's an intermingling here. There's a tying together. And I think it's very important to understand that this is what a priest does. 
Now, don't confuse that with modern day priests in what some people call a church today. Don't do it. That's not the same thing. These priests did this. Our great high priest, our Lord, does this. And I think that there's also a carryover, a priest and a pastor, not the same thing, but the same kind of respect for what's going on here needs to take place within a pastor. And there needs to be that inner weaving with the people. If you're not interwoven with your people, pastor, if you're just, uh, the, the, the popular thing these days in the big churches is you have a teaching pastor, a preaching pastor, and then other pastors to do other things. And that guy is just like a superstar. He comes in, you know, kind of like, uh, <laughs> the, you know, boxing matches. And, and the announcer says, the main event, let's get ready to rumble. And, and here comes the pastor and he comes in and the music's up and, ah, you know, and then he, he leaves before the rest of the congregation does. And you may get to shake his hand, but you don't get much of his time. That's not really pastoring. Now, there's nothing wrong with that being how you do the thing, but he needs to be available to his people. A man who's going to be in the pulpit, he's going to mount that pulpit and speak to those people also needs to be available to invest himself in his people and love those people. Now, that's not to say that if he has a large congregation, he has to deal with every single thing, but he needs to be involved and there needs to be that interweaving. There needs to be that commitment. There needs to be that overlap in those people. So this is that atonement offering and they eat of it and it ties them all together, in my opinion. This is how that operates. Uh, the Hebrew is kafar. You can look that up um, and see if I'm not right about that. And this is the propitiation. This atonement is the propitiation uh, to atone for the sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Hebrews 10.4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. In Hebrews, we're talking about Jesus as the ultimate sacrifice and our superior high priest and he in this portion of it i think it's paul that wrote it but everybody argues about that but the author of hebrews is saying here that these the the, the blood of the bullocks and the goats and all this stuff that was taking place in the tabernacle and later the temple that's not giving the forgiveness that's a picture of and a reminder of what god has promised in the future the christ jesus that ultimate sacrifice for us, that lamb that takes away the sins of the world. So this is not for sin. This is a reminder of what Jesus is doing for the sin. I think they had a good handle on it back then because I think that's what God told them. But over the years, things get messed up. And certainly that's how it's happening in the church in America today. Haven't we forgotten? Haven't we forgotten that you dress for church? Haven't we forgotten that you don't need to wag drinks and food into the into the sanctuary? Haven't we forgotten not to put our feet on the furniture and not to be disruptive and not to be a distraction, not to play video games? It, we, we've gotten crazy in the church. There used to be such respect. There used to be such awe of God and fear of God. Now, I'm not talking about fear of God trembling. I'm scared he's going to hurt me. It's the fear of God that says, I respect him so much. I don't want to do anything to disappoint him. I don't want to do anything against what he'd have me do. That's the fear of the Lord. And we've lost that. But the children of Israel had it here, and they did what the Lord commanded them. And as a matter of fact, in verse 35 there, he says, And thus shalt thou do unto Aaron and his sons, according to all the things which I have commanded thee. Seven days shalt thou consecrate them. And there's that number seven again. Don't you love it? And so this is about being holy. He's commanded them, and he wants it to be holy. For them, seven days shalt thou make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it, and it shall be an altar most holy. Holy is is separated for a purpose. It's and it needs to be holy because of the importance of what they're doing. And I feel like there's a carryover to our modern worship that though it, it we're not burning meat, we're not waving bread around, but we do need to have it be holiness taking place. We need to seek personal holiness. We need to honor the holiness of our Lord. And it said here, whatsoever toucheth the altar shall be holy. This is serious business. Remember the Ark of the Covenant when they were moving it and David moved it like the Philistines did. What well, was on a brand new cart? Well, it's not supposed to be on a cart at all. And a man reached up and steadied it. I think it was David's nephew. Yeah, I think it was his nephew. Reached up and touched it 
and it slew him. God slew him. And the ark didn't slay him. God slayed him because he touched the ark because they were doing it wrong. David got him killed and it scared David. It spooked him. And he found a Levite and said, here, keep this in your barn. <laughs> I don't, you know, because his, his brother-in-law, one of his brothers um, had it in his barn. And they brought it out and put, got a brand new cart for it and brought it. And, you know, the man died. And so he got scared and said, I can't, I'm not messing with this anymore. And so he parked it in the, the barn of a Levite. And that Levite honored that ark and took care of things. It wasn't, you know, I, th- I picture it, it wasn't this way, but I picture it in the barn of David's brother under a tarp that was had some tears in it. And there are mice running around the barn. And it's next to that that old pickup truck that you throw the scrap metal in the bed of it. You know you know what I'm talking about. They didn't have pickup trucks, obviously. But, you know, that's the honor it had. It had no honor. And the, the tarp was probably had holes in it, and it's getting dusty and nasty. Well, when David pawned it off on that Levite, he took good care of it. And God blessed him and his family for the rest of their lives. Because he honored that ark. And I think that's a principle that we need to understand. We need to honor the things of God. And worship is certainly a thing of God. So we need to dress for it. We need to behave for it. We need to honor it with our regular attendance and our commitment and our preparation in advance. We need to be prayed up, confessed up, and ready to seek what God has for us. To hear from his word and to exalt him as holy because he is. So I think these things need to take place. He commanded it to the children of Israel, and I think the understanding is we need to do something very similar. So they consecrated the, the sons of Aaron and Aaron, and they consecrated what they're to do there, and he initiated the continual burnt offering, the one in the morning and the one in the evening. And he said, and to me, this is one of the most exciting verses in this passage here skip down to verse 42 this shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the lord where i will meet you to speak there unto thee god wants to meet with us. And he wanted to meet with the children of Israel. He wanted to meet with Aaron and his sons and the Levitical priests. God wants to meet with us. And so when we go to worship, he wants to meet with us. How disrespectful is it when you, let's say you have a date and you take a girl on a date and they're talking to you and you're kind of ignoring them. And you're looking at your watch, and you're playing on your phone, and you're you're talking to the waiter, or the you know, or you met a friend, and you go down to talk at their table, and you're ignoring your date, um, and either one could be doing this to the other, uh, so disrespectful. Treat that moment you walk in the door. Well, even start when you're at home. Pray up, confess up, but when you get to the church, this is your very first date. Just treat it that way. Because he is our bridegroom. We are his bride. Let us be pure and let us be focused on him. And he will meet us there. Oh, that is so exciting. He will meet us there. So this is very important. The how matters. How we do things matters. It mattered back then with the children of Israel and the tabernacle and the Levitical priesthood. And it matters for us now. And we need to do things to honor our Lord, Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. This is our focus. This is what it ought to be. It matters how we do things. And it mattered back when as well. Um, we, in, in all our dealings, not just our worship, The passage of Abimelech and Abraham. This is a very important exchange that we need to understand. Then Abimelech called Abraham. Remember, Abraham uh, went and said, uh, you know, went into Egypt and said, this is my sister. Well, she was his half sister or something. Um, (laughs) A little yikes, but this is how God had things ordained. Um, But he distanced himself, afraid that they might kill him to have her. Well, do you want them to have your wife thinking he's your sister? Anyway, Abimelech 
came to understand that they were married and he he took her back to Abraham and said, look, take her. You are going to lead us into sin. That's inappropriate. And Abraham had to hear it from this unbeliever that he was practicing sinful things. He wasn't doing things as God would have him do. He wasn't uh, behaving as to the Lord. He was behaving as to protecting his little hide and not trusting the Lord for his protection. He was doing things in a worldly fashion, in his own wisdom, which wasn't so wise in this case. And so Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? Because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. Well, he was leading them into sin, but Abimelech wouldn't have it. And Abraham got the lesson in that day that it needs to be done right. You need to do everything you do. Do it right. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Later on in Joshua chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And you skip down to verse 5, they went to battle at Ai, and the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men. For they chased them from before the gate, even so they approached the gate, and the people of Ai came out and chased them and killed them as they went. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. God wants things done appropriately. And it matters. It matters. Now, when we talk about the account of Samuel and Saul, remember Saul had a victory. He had been in battle and conquered um, a couple kings. And he was told by Samuel, when you're done, you're mopping up, uh, I will come and I will make sacrifice to the Lord to honor him for all this. But Samuel was late, um, according to Saul. And so when Samuel approached, Saul had already done these things. And Samuel said, thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept. This is First Samuel 13. 13 through 14, thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. And it turned out whose kingdom is it established? David's now, right? Um, And Saul blew it. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be a captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. There is a right way and Saul didn't do it. When God specifies, he expects it. And he, everything we do needs to be done to honor God, to lift up the name of Jesus, and to, to advance the kingdom for our Lord's sake. Not to advance our kingdom, but to advance his kingdom, to do things his way. We don't dress for comfort. We dress to honor God. And I'm going to keep chasing that rabbit. I'm going to beat that horse till there's nothing left. Uh, Matthew uh, chapter 25, verses 9 through 12. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. We're talking about the account of the virgins. We had ten virgins. Five brought extra oil. Five did not. And the ones that did not, when there was a midnight cry, they woke up and they said, Hey, our lamps have gone out. Give us some oil. And the wise said, No, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Going on in verse 10, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready that had the oil, the wise ones went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. They had not established a relationship by being obedient. They didn't think enough of the command to have the extra oil to do that thing. And it ended up costing them. They they bet they they supposed in the, of themselves and said, ah, it'll be enough, it'll be enough. But we don't know how the Lord will time things out. We need to be faithful to the end. We need to be prepared in all things to be faithful and continually faithful to the Lord. He has a way to do things and expects us to be faithful to those procedures. And those who are not, are not His. So how is it with you today? Are you honoring the Lord in all that you do? Are you paying attention? Because how we do things matters. How do you approach worship? How do you behave in worship? Do you gossip, write notes, look around to see who's what and what's what? Complaining about this, bragging about that. 
Is that what you're doing? We need to set the world aside when we go in that place to worship. Now, the room is not special, except that we built it to worship in. And so it means something. And when we approach the Lord, we need to approach with dignity. We need to approach honoring Him. I miss the old days when we called it a sanctuary. It's not an auditorium. It's a sanctuary. And it's very important for us to understand the magnitude of what we're doing. We're celebrating the truth of the gospel of what Jesus, the Christ, did for us. We're teaching God's word. We're singing about how wonderful God is to us and how he keeps his many precious promises, how he's full of grace and mercy. These are the things we need to be doing in our worship time. How is that for you? Are you thanking God on a regular basis for all he's done for you? Are you spending time in your prayer closet and in the word, getting close to the Lord? It's not the doing of the things. It's not going to church. It's not knocking on doors. It's not preaching, teaching, singing. Those are not the things that make us close to God. Those are to be the fruit of that. You can fake those things, and I think many of us are. You might be. You might be. I've done it. We've all done it. We've all just kind of phoned it in. But we need to not do that. We need to be in our prayer closet, be in the Word, getting next to our Lord and becoming more like Him. And when we do so, The fruit that springs up when we drill down into the Lord, we have a deeper relationship with Him. What springs up from that will be the fruit of the Spirit. Just like a gusher of crude oil, that the fruit of the Spirit will come out and the doing of those things won't be so tedious, won't be so tiring. We won't be doing it in our own strength. It's exciting how He sets things up to operate. It's exciting what we have to worship Him for and about. And I pray that you will take your worship seriously as the children of Israel did, as God does. That we be serious in all things as we worship our Lord because the how matters. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for this splendid example in this wonderful picture of your son through the tabernacle, through the offerings through the consecration, all of this for you. Now, Lord, help us to be committed to you and you. Give us strength and courage to do and face these things and to be the example we need to be, to lift up the name of Jesus, that all men will be drawn to you. We ask these things in that name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I thank you for your kind attention, and I hope you'll return. Come on back and continue reflecting in in, uh, the book of Exodus and continue with us as we continue reflecting on his word. Bye now. Thank you for joining us in our Bible study. Join us again as we continue reflecting on his word.